Welcome, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Uh, my name is Stuart DeCue. I'm the program director at the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. Uh, and uh, welcome to another installment of the GE Colloquium in Sustainability Leadership. Uh, this one is um, really has a lot of personal satisfaction uh, for me um, in that we get to hear from uh, Andy Hoffman, uh, who's currently the education director at the Graham Institute uh, for Sustainability at the University of Michigan and is the wholesome professor of sustainable enterprise um, uh, there as well. And Andy is one of the kind of inspirations uh, across the academic community for how do you create uh, a climate that is student-centered um, and really engages and inspires people uh, to develop their ideas to be pathfinders rather than followers, uh, and also somebody who really believes and uh, seeks out ways to make sure that the impact of the ideas are felt beyond uh, the academic community, and has made a um, has really had a trailbla trailblazing career of doing that in creating ways that academics can collaborate um, through the Alliance for Research and Corporate Sustainability to the development and enhancement of the Herb Institute at the School of Michigan uh, to now the new initiative that he's the leading, the he's the education director of the Graham Institute, which is really you know, a pan-university initiative to connect on sustainability issues. Um, and he's just a very thoughtful and decent uh, at his core human being who's always just been incredibly generous with his time uh, and expertise and engaging with students and others. Um, so we're thrilled uh, to have him here uh, in this series uh, talking about a, uh, a topic which we think is um, critical for everybody at school management, school forestry, uh, and for Cross Yale uh, to understand. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Andy Hoffman. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And what a beautiful building you have. It's, uh, it's really nice to sort of compare notes. We're building a new building at Michigan, but uh, to see what the competition or the, the peer schools are doing. I love your little peepholes on the side. That's really nice. I am amused that you guys can see the clock and the professor can't. I'm not sure what <laughs> message they're trying to send there. Um, what I want to talk about today is climate change. But I want to talk about it from a lens that uh, many people have not considered it from, and that's from the social sciences. Uh, you do have Tony Lacerowitz here. You have Dan Kahan here. So this may not be as unique a message as uh, I've experienced when I've talked about it in other spaces. Um, but I think it's a very helpful lens for understanding what you may have experienced when you go home for Christmas or Thanksgiving or Easter dinner and you find yourself faced with that brother or sister, aunt or uncle, father or mother, who says climate change is a hoax. And you have a very difficult dilemma of what do you do when faced with that? Do I ruin the family gathering by having this debate? And how do I understand where they're coming from? And how can I approach the conversation in a way that will be fruitful and productive and not break down into a stalemate or a contest or hurt feelings? And so that's what I want to bring to you today. And it's in the form of this book here. Uh, which came out recently, to try and understand why do people reject the science of climate change? How can we understand what's going on in the public and political discourse where the majority of Republican candidates say that climate change is a hoax, the majority or the, the unanimity of the Democratic candidates say it's real and this is what we're going to do about it? How do we understand this tension and this conflict that's going on? I'm going to do it in the form that you're all taught to give presentations. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. Then I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I told you. <laughs> the two bookends of telling you what I'm going to tell you and tell you what I told you are going to be done in the form of stories or vignettes to really drive the point, and the middle will be the meat of what's in the book. So to begin, the first story, what got me started, hey, Reed, uh, got me started in this area. Uh, I was invited by the development office at the University of Michigan to meet with a potential donor. This is not an uncommon request. Uh, we're in the midst of a capital campaign right now. They're going to raise $4.5 billion. I still have trouble saying that number. Uh, it's really an astonishing figure. And they parade faculty in front of potential donors that they'll give us money to further our efforts. And this gentleman said he was interested in sustainability and was fascinated by my work. Would I meet with him? The only time I was free was 7 o'clock in the morning. And so I show up at 7 o'clock in the morning, still half asleep, cradling my cup of coffee. I sit down. The potential donor is across the table from me. The development officer is to my right. And the potential donor starts the conversation by saying, I think the scientific review process is corrupt. That was his opening line. 
And that kind of woke me up pretty fast. And so I said, what do you think of a university based on that system? He says, I think that university is corrupt as well. He went on to say that he thought that climate change was a hoax. And so we talked about sunspots and solar flares. We kicked that around for a while. And then he turned his sights on me and he said, can you tell me why you hate capitalism and why you want to destroy the market by teaching environmental issues in a business school? So we kicked that around for a little while. And then he said, now, do you know why Earth Day is on the day it's on? And I was pretty punchy by then, and I said, uh, no, I don't know why Earth Day is on the day it's on. He said, because that's Karl Marx's birthday. <laughs> so I turned to the development officer and I said, what's our agenda here this morning? And the potential donor said, I want to buy you a ticket to the Heartland Conference. And if you're not familiar, the Heartland Conference is the number one climate skeptics conference in the world. I did a quick mental check of my calendar. I had a conflict. I said, I'm sorry, I can't make it. The meeting ended, and I was pretty angry. I felt that this was a bait and switch. I didn't feel he was serious about sustainability at all, and I was really, really kind of ticked off. But something curious happened. Through the day, as I talked to colleagues about it, and I started to think about it, I actually started to become fascinated, because everything he said hung together. Everything he said worked into a consistent worldview. It's not a worldview I share, but it's a worldview nonetheless that led him to look at the very same scientific information and come to a completely different conclusion than I do. I study cultures, I study institutions, I study how they form, how they evolve, how they change, how they die. And so this became very interesting to me to try and understand climate change through a cultural lens. And so I'm going to give you the punchline of the book. I'm going to give it to you right off the bat. You can then go back to your email or go to sleep or whatever you want to do. But the punchline is this, that the public debate over climate change right now in this country is not about CO2. It's not about climate models. It's about conflicting worldviews and people defending values that they feel are threatened by the reality of climate change. If you can see it in this light, it can teach you one very important thing, and that is this. When you find yourself engaged in a debate with someone who doesn't believe climate change is real, sometimes the worst thing you can do is what we all do, and that's whip out your PowerPoint deck and start hitting them with more scientific information. If they are looking at that scientific information through a completely different worldview than you possess, more scientific information is not going to help. In fact, it's actually going to get them to dig their heels in even harder. And you need to understand the subtext and the conversation that they're hearing. Why do they distrust the message if you're going to get any traction on this issue? And that's what I want to try and show you today is what is the subtext of that conversation. Let me begin by saying that the climate, con the climate change in the eyes of people who do not believe the science is not an issue of pollution. CO2 is natural. I am exhaling it right now. Plants are inhaling it. It's part of the natural system. It's not something we want to reduce to zero. Although the terminology right now is carbon pollution, for a lot of people that just doesn't make sense from a cultural point of view, from a lens of worldview that doesn't work. What climate change is, is an existential challenge to our worldview. And that's a big mouthful, and I'll back this up. But I want you to think about the fundamental question of climate change. The fundamental cultural question of climate change is this. Do you believe that we as a species have grown to such numbers and our technology to such power that we can alter the global climate? Think about that question for a second, because if you answer that question yes, that totally changes our conceptions of ourselves and the environment that have existed since the beginning of time. That changes our conception of a number of other issues. If you answer that question, yes, then my mowing my lawn in Ann Arbor has import for poor people in low-lying areas of Bangladesh. Do you believe that we are ready for a global ethic that brings that into account? I don't think so. It gives you a sense of the challenge before us, the cultural challenge before us. If you answer that question, yes, then what leads following that is perhaps we should have some kind of a correction in the market. Maybe we should have a carbon price. You can start to get a sense of what might be uncomfortable in the present political climate. You're talking about more government, bigger government. 
That is obviously a hot button issue. Then let's take it further. We should have this carbon price on a global scale. Who should do that? Maybe the United Nations. Now, if you haven't sit, seen the hot button I've hit, hit there, start to talk to people about whether the United States should be involved in the United Nations. A lot of people think we should pull out. Let's go even further. For some people, the idea of climate change challenges their notion of God and divine providence. We are not in charge out there. God's in charge out there. It's hubris to think that we are that powerful that we can get in the way of what God is doing out in the environment. I got heckled at a talk one time. Someone said, climate change can't be happening. Read Genesis. God gave nature for us to do with as we wish. God prom promised Noah he would never flood the earth again. This cannot be happening. When you put it in that lens, when you put it on that plane, it can highlight the point, hit this person with more data, and they're talking about Genesis. You're talking right past each other. You're not even talking about the same thing. And so that's where we have to start to focus to really bring some kind of resolution to the partisan nature of the climate change debate. There's the book. You can now go to sleep, eat your lunch, uh, or you can continue hearing me. You can, I will tell you what's in the book. I will give some meat to those bones, and then I'll close with another vignette to drive the point home uh, to tell you what I told you. So let's just start from a very, what I find fascinating sociological phenomenon, and that's two divergent trends. Trend number one, <clears throat> taking place within the scientific community. You have the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change coming out with successively more definitive statements that climate change is real and we are doing it. Here's the statements from 2013, 2014. If you're not familiar, and I suspect this audience is, but just in case, the IPCC doesn't do science themselves. They pull all the science together and they produce a consensus statement, a consensus document. This is what the body of the science says. This consensus statement has been endorsed by over 200 scientific agencies around the world, including the scientific agencies of every one of the G8 plus five countries. If you look at surveys of practicing climate scientists, and this is important, practicing climate scientists, not for example, Two years ago, the Wall Street Journal published a letter saying that climate change is not real. It was signed by 15 scientists. One was a marketing professor at Wharton. One was a research and development director at ExxonMobil. These are practicing climate scientists, and you can see numbers in the high 80s to high 90s saying, this is happening, folks, and we are doing it. If you look at the literature on science, the science of climate change, the most recent being this study in 2013, 97.1% of the papers that say climate change, that discuss climate change, say that it is happening and humans are causing it. The science is so compelling that the American Association for Advancement of Science and the National Academies of Sciences use the word consensus to describe the state of science. There is a scientific consensus that this is real and we are doing it. That's trend number one. Trend number two, Belief in science, of the science of climate change, declined from 71 to 57% among Americans between 2008 and 2009. Now it's up around 67%. 97% of the papers say climate change is real. 67% of Americans actually believe it. What's even more curious is that belief that most scientists think the global warming is happening actually declined from 47 to 39% among Americans between 2008 and 2011. So not only do only two-thirds of Americans believe that climate change is real? The majority of Americans don't think that scientists think it's real. This, wherever you stand on the issue, is fascinating. And what's also fascinating is we could be talking about climate change, or we could be talking about the safety of eating GMOs. We could be talking about nuclear power, gun control, health care. We could talk about Jenny McCarthy and what she's been able to do to convince parents not to vaccinate their children for fear of autism, even though the scientific establishment says there is no connection. We are in an interesting domain hey, Marianne, where science has become highly politicized, where it has entered the culture wars. And we need to understand that and do something about that if we're going to move forward on so many issues that matter so much. So sociologically, I find this fascinating. And we need to understand why, why this is happening on this issue and so many others. I want to focus on climate change in this talk. So 
The outline for the talk I'm gonna give you is first, I wanna give you a sense of the idea of climate change as a cultural issue. Not as a scientific issue strictly, but as a cultural issue. An issue of values and beliefs. I wanna talk about the four forms of distrust that animate this conversation. When you find yourself in that debate over the Thanksgiving or Christmas table, why do they not trust the message? And there are four domains or four areas where you can try and categorize where that distrust comes from. Now, I could usually stop there. Most uh, you know, environmental talks do. We get you all depressed. I thought the inconvenient truth did this to me. We walked out, uh, things are really bad, and then I've done my job. But I'd rather not stop there. I say, well, what do we do about it? Well, I see three possible paths forward. And this comes from the literature on negotiations, dispute resolution, managerial decision making, and then four tactics for moving forward in a productive way that fall right on top of those four forms of distrust. I wanna give a quick sense of the full scope of the issue and then as promised, I will end with another vignette to tell you what I just told you, okay? So there's the game plan. And we have, I'll try and get this done in about half an hour so that we can open it up for questions. First, I wanna give you a sense of the, thinking about the difference between a scientific consensus and a social consensus. A scientific consensus happens with a specific domain, with a specific set of characters using a specific set of reasoning. It happens in scientific journals, it happens in scientific conferences, it uses the scientific method, it takes place among scientists. The social debate, a social consensus, happens among a much broader array of constituents that use reason, but they also use emotion. And they are driven by values that give them a certain lens on seeing things. We do not all use the same process for understanding complex information. Whether you like it or not, Rush Limbaugh matters in this debate. So does a politician, James Inhofe. So does a clergy, so do sports figures, so do Hollywood actors. They're all part of the social discourse. One thing that I would like you to take away is the idea that moving from a scientific consensus to a social consensus takes time. It's natural for us to be going through what we're going through right now. We've done this on many other issues. I have up here a picture of cigarettes and human health. For decades, scientists have said that cigarettes cause cancer. For decades, the American public did not accept that conclusion. And through a process of social debate and social discourse, we've come to a social consensus that cigarettes cause cancer. For you in this present time, you may not appreciate how far we've come on this issue, but if you go back to the 1950s and 60s, these are advertisements showing you not only that cigarettes aren't bad for you, they're actually good for you. Over here on the left, more doctors smoke camel cigarettes than any other cigarette. Your doctor is telling you to smoke cigarettes. Over here on the right, more scientists and educators smoke Kent. Your professors are telling you to smoke cigarettes. Uh, your dentist is telling you to smoke cigarettes. Your dentist recommends viceroys. This was the state of the discourse, the public discourse over cigarettes and cancer. And just like the climate scientists of today, the epidemiologists, the scientists that were studying cancer and cigarettes were just as frustrated by the state there. But we now have a social consensus that cigarettes cause cancer. How do you know we have a social consensus? because people feel free to explain it to others, particularly young people, that this is the correct way to see the world around them. I am willing to bet that if your brother or sister, if your niece or nephew sat down at the kitchen table and lit up a cigarette, you'd have a conversation with them about, is this really a good idea? Do you understand the health risks of what you're doing? I'm willing to bet that if your brother or sister, niece or nephew's friend who you may have never met before, sat down and lit up a cigarette, you might have the same conversation with them. That's how you know you have a social consensus. You're not afraid to bring it up in conversation. How do we know we don't have a social consensus on climate change? Because right here from Yale, a study shows that two thirds of Americans rarely if ever discuss global warming with friends or family. It seems to have joined sex, politics, and religion as topics that you don't bring up in polite company. That is a sign we don't have a social consensus. And so how do we move towards a social consensus? How do we understand? Let's start by looking at people's positions on climate change. And again, this work coming out of Yale, uh, the Six America study. How many people have seen this? How many people have not seen this? Everybody on this campus has probably seen this. This is great work. So people's positions on climate change are not binary. It's not yes or no, but are along a spectrum. And, and Tony and his work 
has broken into uh, six categories from alarmed all the way to dismissive and everywhere in between. The interesting question is, how do we understand people's positions along the spectrum? Now typically demographic variables on environmental issues are these. It's women care about the environment more than men, young more than old, urban more than rural, the coasts more than the middle. I live in Michigan now, I see this. Um, educated more than less so, affluent more than less so, Democrat more than Republican. On climate change, most of those demographic variables go away. The number one correlate on people's belief in climate change is political party affiliation. If I ask you, are you a Democrat or a Republican, I will get a stronger sense of being able to predict where you stand on climate change than any of those other demographic variables. In fact, it's very interesting to watch how this has played out. Uh, here's some work at the Brookings Institution from 2011. 78% of Democrats believe climate change is real, 47% of Republicans. You can see at the bottom right here, the numbers starting to come up among Republicans. And in fact, more recent surveys show that Republican voters are up above 50% in their belief of climate change, while Democratic voters are up in the 90s now. So that's very interesting. But the slide on the left, take a look at that. On the bottom, and this is Riley Dunlap and Aaron McCright, between 2001 and 2010, Republicans have a de decreasing belief in climate change, Democrats having an increasing belief in climate change. That is fascinating to me. And if you're curious, if we were to graph that further to the left, those two lines, they meet in 1997. Why is 1997 important? That's the year Kyoto Treaty was signed. And why is that important? Because that's when an issue that was primarily a scientific issue now became an issue that threatened powerful political and economic interests and the climate change issue got thrust into the culture wars in this country in a way that scientists were not prepared. There's a lot of joking that the scientists were like the Boy Scouts going against the Marines when they suddenly found, found themselves in a fight with fossil fuel interests and conservative interests. That's what's at play here. And so this to me is the smoking gun that this is a cultural issue. Are Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives taught about science in any different way? No. How do they look at the climate change issue through a particular lens, a liberal or conservative lens? What do they see? And why do they see something different? It's about culture and it's about worldviews. That's what we're looking at here. So let me walk through some social psychology to help you see this. Just four points to try and make it as painless as possible. First of all, we all use cognitive filters. We all use what's called motivated reasoning. We will gladly and readily accept something if it supports our worldviews. We will resist or downright reject something if it challenges our worldviews. We do this in our, all our lives. We're all prone to this. Um, I am driving my car and I hear a thump up in the front right quarter, front, front right quarter. What's going through my head? Oh, it's a stone in the wheel. Oh, it's something minor. Why? Because I do not want to bring this car to a mechanic. I'm motivated to yield a conclusion that may be at variance of the evidence coming towards me, but I want a certain conclusion. We all do this. Where does that motivated reasoning come from? Where does that filter come from? Well, it comes from the people and the groups we associate with. This cultural cognition is Dan Kahn's work here at the Yale Law School, but we're influenced by group values. We want to fit with the people we're around. And so if I associate if I work in a workplace or I associate with a group whose beliefs say that climate change is a hoax, I will be more inclined to believe that way. I have a brother, I love him dearly. He moved from Michigan to Texas. I've watched his politics swing to the right. This is something for you all to recognize. I have a lot of students who think they are the supreme individual. They will go into ExxonMobil, they will hold firm to their values and they will change Exxon. I have news for you, culture is very powerful. The organizations of which you are part will force you into conformity. Um, a very well-known book, Moral Mazes, I don't know if that's still on the uh, syllabi at courses, but he, Moral Mazes, he, a Jackal looked at this, that you go join an organization, the organization will have its way unless you have certain tactics to try and deal with this. It's not just who we associate with, but who do we trust? And I wanna hang on that word, trust. This is all about trust. Who do you trust as a valued spokesman for understanding something that is extremely complex. So for example, I can offer two names 
and I'm willing to bet that one of them will make your stomach twist because you will not trust what that person says. The other one you may be more inclined to believe. Al Gore, Rush Limbaugh. I can do that with any audience. One of those words, one of those names, you will think to yourself, I don't care if they say the sun will rise tomorrow, I'm gonna to look at the empirical, empirical evidence before I take their word for it. That starts to create the divide. I can offer two news sources. Who do you trust, Fox News or NPR? There are actually studies to show increasing viewership of Fox News, decreasing belief in climate change, increasing listenership of NPR, increasing belief in climate change. Because they represent values that we trust. I trust NPR. I would also add, I am part of the academic community. Whether you like it or not, the academic community leans left. We are part of a liberal institution. I have a lot of colleagues get ticked off when I say that, but surveys show it to be true. Liberals outnumber the, the conservatives four to one in law schools, and that's the closest ratio, all the way down to 18 to one in history departments. This is at play here as well, both in terms of the constant diet of information we get, and I like to challenge my students, I do try and bring in conservative voices to try and wake them up that there's another way of looking at these issues. And it also is important of how we're perceived. And so I, as an academic, am perceived as a lefty by many people who may be disinclined to believe my or hear what I have to say. So cultural cognition is at play. Over time, once we connect something to our personal identity, to our personal culture, then no amount of information can overcome that or it's very difficult to overcome that. Uh, the idea that we are boundedly rational, we are not perfectly rational utility, utility maximizing units as economics would like us to think, that we're limited in the amount of capacity we have for bringing information in and for processing it, or psychologists like to describe we're cognitive misers. We have a limited amount of time and ability to gather information, we will spend it very, very carefully. And we get very uncomfortable when we have to spend it in ways we weren't prepared to do it. For example, I don't know how many of you can remember this. I can remember very vividly the first time I walked into an organic food store and went to the cereal aisle. And I was faced with a wall of cereals, none of which I had ever seen before. And this was very distressing. I now had to you know, expend effort to make a decision that used to be automatic and easy. I grabbed my Cheerios, I'm out the door. Now I had to look and try and figure out what to do. We're cognitive misers, we're limited in how much we want to spend information or spend energy to try and make sense out of things. And so we look to people we trust. I may not read the IPCC reports, but I trust my colleagues and atmospheric scientists who say this is real. Someone else may say, I don't trust the IPCC reports, but I trust my pastor who says this is false. That's good enough for me because that person represents my values, not that lefty professor over at the University of Michigan. This has to be put in here that climate change threatens powerful political and economic interests that will not go down easily. And so you have to put this in here that this is part of the conversation and it clouds the conversation and that's part of the debate we're going through right now. All this leads to what I told you at the beginning that once our minds are made up and our positions aligned with our cultural identity providing additional scientific data can make us more resolute and resisting conclusions that are at variance with our cultural beliefs. Hit them with that PowerPoint deck they're saying, I, this, this is challenging my notion of God. They're giving me more data. What's the next thing they're thinking? This person thinks I'm stupid. So what do you do? You give them more data. And what do they think? This person thinks I'm really stupid. And now the debate begins, or the conflict begins. Last fall, the National Climate Assessment came out. The New York Times had an editorial saying, finally, the debate is over. This is definitive. Who can argue against? this mounting evidence, and I just read this editorial saying that's not what this is about. The debate is much deeper and much stronger and it's about trust. So, if science is not on the table, CO2 is not on the table, what is on the table? Let's begin by saying that we go through our lives activating black boxes. This is an idea from Max Weber at the turn of the century, this is not mine. Uh, and what he was saying was that we, activate black boxes, we don't look inside them. I get in my car in the morning, I turn it on. I have no idea what happened under the hood, the car gets me where I need to go. I go to the airport, I have no idea how a jet engine works, I have no idea how air traffic control works, I certainly don't know how TSA works. But it gets me where I need to go. I don't look inside the black box. I go to the doctor, the doctor says take this drug, I don't know how the drug works, I take it. 
If we had to open every single black box, we would become emotional and psychological cripples. So it is valid that you look to trusted sources to shortcut decisions. If all of us, how many people can say they've read all the IPCC documents? I can't. How do we make a decision? Because we're surrounded by people that we trust that say this is true. That is at play. And the truth is, most Americans don't open the black box of science. Here's surveys by the California Academy of Sciences. The, uh, the majority of the US public is unable to pass even a basic, basic scientific literacy test. And the National Science Foundation says that two thirds of Americans do not clearly understand the scientific process. Yet I can also tell you, I've seen studies or surveys to show that upwards of 87% of Americans think they understand climate science. It was a very funny disconnect there. We overestimate our understanding of science, yet most people don't open this black box. So what do they hear when they hear climate change? I'm gonna put it in the area of four forms of distrust. First, they distrust the messengers. So I don't care what Al Gore is saying. I don't trust Al Gore. I don't care what scientists are saying. I don't trust scientists. My potential donor thought that the scientific review process was corrupt. He doesn't trust scientists. The three primary spokesmen on climate change right now are environmentalists, democratic politicians, and scientists. Environmentalists, these are quotes. Actually, one of my doctoral students, I told her about my meeting with the potential donor, and I said I was invited to this conference. I can't go. And she lit up, and she said I would love to go. And so she went and we wrote a paper on what are the frames that people use at the Heartland Conference to describe climate change. What language were they using? What values do those represent? And so these are quotes from the Heartland Conference. And so AGW believers, that's anthropogenic global warming believers, they hate people, they hate the Western economy. The environmental agenda seeks to use the state to create scarcity as a means to exert their will and the state's authority over your lives. Environmentalists want to take your freedom away. Environmentalists are socialist borderline communists. There's an expression for environmentalists. They're watermelons. They're green on the outside. They're red on the inside. I don't trust what they say. I was driving through uh, a part of Ohio, big Bible Belt country. I sometimes listen to the conservative talk shows to get a sense, and you should all do this, to get a sense of how they view things. And there was this conversation where someone said, we all know the environmental movement is pagan at its core. Off he went. That's what they see. That's what they believe. So environmentalists, by a major, a major portion of the American public, are not trusted. They're not believed. Democratic politicians, that not, you don't have to go through much of an explanation there. That's pretty straightforward. And scientists. Uh, a lot of people look at scientists as these pointy-headed Elites sitting in an ivory tower using a language they don't understand, talking about issues they don't comprehend, and having a disproportionate influence on the political process. I don't trust them. So those are the primary spokesmen, and they are not trusted by many Americans. Second, they don't trust the process that created the, the, the message. So the peer review process, here's a quote, the peer review process has become the pal review process. You only get published if you'll satisfy the political interests of the editors, you'll only get funding if you satisfy the political interests of the grantors. They also don't trust the UN. Uh, ClimateGate really fed into that quite nicely. If you're not familiar with ClimateGate, some emails were hacked into it at the University of East Anglia. What we learned basically is that scientists can behave as cattily as the rest of us, but there was no wrongdoing, but they used that to say that the scientific review process is corrupt. So they don't trust the process. They don't trust the message. One is they are uncomfortable with these disaster scenarios that a lot of people are putting out there. We all believe the world is a nice place. I do believe that this talk will end. I will have a nice lunch. I'm going to have a nice dinner tonight. I will get home. The world is nice. And now people are showing pictures of Florida underwater. And people say, no, this doesn't work. This doesn't make sense. Uh, how many people saw the movie The Day After Tomorrow? Okay one of the worst movies for communicating climate change. Manhattan underwater with glaciers moving down Madison Avenue, it just gets people to shut down and say this is not true, this can't be happening. David King has a nice book on climate change. What I like about it most is he has two appendices. One says this is what climate skeptics say and this is why they're, why they're wrong. The second one says this is what climate alarmists say and this is why they're wrong. And he calls it climate porn. It's titillating, it's meant to excite, it's false. And a lot of people fall back on this, and it violates what people generally believe about the world around them, that the world is actually a nice place. It challenges people's belief in God. And I would add also that it's important to people that people have different conceptions of risk. Some people say the environmental risk is too great, we better do something. Other people say the economic risk is too great, we better not. 
Some people drive motorcycles without a helmet. I wear mine. Some people still smoke. We all have different conceptions of risk, and that plays into our analysis of complex information. And finally, the distrust of solutions that come about from this. Uh, if we're talking about a carbon price, we're talking about an increased role of government in our lives. That is certainly a vibrant debate in this country right now. Uh, fear of a one world government, the UN perhaps taking this over. Uh, different conceptions of the value of nature. And importantly, a lot of people don't like solutions that restrict the market. There are surveys that show increasing faith in the market, decreasing belief in climate change. That's motivated reasoning in action. I'm not gonna believe climate change because I don't want to see restraints on the market. There you can start to see the right-left divide start to emerge. So these are the four forms of distrust that are at play. And I can give you a vivid example of how this can come out in conversation. Uh, I'm in a golf league back in Michigan, and I love this golf league because there's no academics in it. Uh, it's plumbers and electricians and traveling salesmen, and we don't talk about work. So it's a nice release and escape for me, and we mostly basically uh, drink beer and knock some golf balls around. I've been in the league for eight years, and then two summers ago, I'm on the trunk of my car lacing up my golf shoes. Another golfer, Greg, is on the trunk of his car lacing up his golf shoes, and he finally asks, he says, Andy, what do you do anyway? I've been in the league eight years. So I say, well, I'm a professor. He says, what do you teach? I said, I teach environmental issues in the business school. He said, do you mean like climate change? That's not real, is it? What do you do? I can hit him with the data and make him feel about this small because he doesn't understand the science. I could talk about all the unsustainable things we do in our lives and he can start to feel judged of that, that Hemi that's under the hood or the very big house with the manicured lawn that he's very proud of. I could talk about the partisan divide, but for all I know, he's a Republican, and we're gonna get into that mess. There are not many pleasant scenarios that can come out from that question, and perhaps you've faced it yourselves. So I try and diffuse it. I simply say, well, you know, actually, the science is quite compelling, and I drop it. His next question is, Andy, are you a Democrat or a Republican? So I said, well, I'm an independent. And he said, what do you think of Al Gore? And so I said what I said in the book. I said I think he called needed attention to the issue, but he unfortunately politicized the issue by making it a democratic issue. Oh, and the conversation stopped. We went and played golf. We picked it up again a little later. I think about that conversation because I think, what was he doing in that line of questioning? He's trying to figure out if he trusts me. Am I one of those enviro Nazi crazies that's gonna to start to give him a lecture, or does he actually wanna to listen to me? And too many people that care about climate change do not take the time to develop trust with the people they're discussing it with. They automatically move into teacher-student roles or lecturing roles and say, you know, the science is here, and off we go. And that doesn't work. You have to engage people, gain their trust, then they will listen to you. So these are the forms of distrust that are on the table. Again, what do we do with this? Where can we go? Well, there are three possible paths forward. Anyone who's taken negotiations, dispute resolution, this fits in with the three possible kinds of negotiations you have, win-lose, win-win, mixed motive, integrative, distributive, mixed motive. So the win-win is the optimistic path. If we're talking about a debate over values, the best outcome is a solution where people don't have to change their values or their worldviews at all. They can continue to drive that big SUV, live in that big house, everything will be fine. How do we do that? We develop some killer technology tomorrow that solves the day. Elon Musk will save us. <laughs> and a lot of us are hoping for that to happen. We're waiting for that technology, whether it's solar or wind, whether it's electric cars, whether it's car sharing, we won't have to change what we do. We won't have to change what we believe. There's the optimistic path. There's also the pessimistic path, where no one will change their values, they just want to force you to change yours. And I call this a cultural schism, where we're talking past each other. And I can give you an example in our society today, and that's called the abortion debate. In the abortion debate, you have two sides talking about completely different issues. One side is talking about choice, the other side is talking about life. They only look for information that confirms their position, disconfirms the other. They demonize, they even hurt the other. If you disagree with me, you're evil. That is playing out in the climate change debate right now. I have a folder in my inbox for hate mail. I get it quite regularly, and mine is mild. Michael Mann at Penn State has had an envelope mailed to him with white powder in it. Catherine Hale at Texas Tech has had gotten emails threatening her with bodily harm and threatening her children with bodily harm because she studies climate change. This is at play in the debate. 
Neither of those are appealing outcomes or realistic outcomes. We want to move towards a consensus-based path. And again, going down to negotiations, if you've taken a negotiations class, one of the first things they teach you is move away from positions and focus on interests. I don't want to talk about whether you believe in climate change or not. I want to understand what are the values that are threatened or influence that decision? How do we get that on the table? And so with that, to move towards that third path, let me walk through four tactics that can help us move forward in this conversation. They map exactly on those four forms of distrust. First of all, the messenger is as important as the message. So we need climate brokers. We need people out there that are trusted by the communities that are not reached right now. So I want to hear farmers in Michigan hearing it from a farmer down the street. I want them hearing it in the Kiwanis Club. I want to hear it in Town Hall. I want them to hear it from people they trust. I want business people to hear it from business people. I want conservative evangelicals to hear it from conservative evangelicals. I need to recognize that I, as a professor at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, will have great difficulty parachuting into the middle of Michigan and talking to a farmer that climate change is real because all they're hearing is there's that elite prof lefty professor from the University of Michigan. We need to recognize that the messenger is as important as the message. So you need to know your audience and speak the language of your audience. I give talks on climate change and business audiences. I don't talk about radiative forcing. I don't talk about carbon loading. I talk about cost of capital, operational efficiency, consumer demand. I put it in a language they can grasp and understand, and it works. I gave a talk once to the Michigan Manufacturers Association. I get, I get this a lot, and it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. I get the head of the trade group inviting me in, knowing that the membership is going to be hostile to my message. I, I feel like red meat thrown in in front of these people. And before the talk started, this guy came in at the beginning, sat in the front row, and slapped a book on the table for direct effect. And the, the title was Fakes in Me, and it was called The Climate Hoax. So I kind of knew what was going to happen. And so the, in the middle of my talk, he interrupted. He said, this is all nonsense because climate change is not real. To which I said, I don't care. You can be agnostic about the science of climate change and still see the business issue because regulations will change your market. Consumers want to see more of it. Banks and insurance companies are starting to change their premium coverage because of this. I put it in the language you could understand. What could he say? I wasn't going to debate the science with them. I was going to say this is a business issue. Know your audience. I think the two most impro important brokers that need to come forward are brokers from the market and brokers from the ideological right. We need more conservative Republicans, and I mean Republicans sitting in office, not retired or Republicans voted out of office saying this is real. And we need people from the market because they will be trusted in a way that others can't. This past September, the CEOs of Cargill and General Mills came out with statements saying climate change is real. We are doing it. If we don't do something about it, we'll have food shortages in the short to medium term. That message has clout far more than if Al Gore said it, or the EPA said it, or if EDF said it. It's important that the message be delivered from people that audiences trust. So I think those two, they're starting to come forward. They need to come forward more. Second, address the process by which the message was created. There is a strong correlation in surveys to show once people buy into the idea that there's a scientific consensus, then they will start to accept this as real. When people challenge me, and this is my advice to you, don't get into debate on the science. Everyone, you know, a lot of skeptics have their little pet theory on what is wrong here. I fall back on what I opened the slide deck with. 200 scientific agencies say this real, including the, every one of the G8 plus five. The National Academies of Sciences says there's scientific consensus. That's good enough for me. What do you know that they don't know? That's my tack. And once you can start to get them to see that there is a scientific consensus, they start to roll on this. Uh, avoid cataclysmic scenarios, avoid climate porn, and separate the problem from the solution. If they move straight to, I don't want to see a carbon price, that's not what we're talking about. Climate change is real. What we do about it, that's a separate conversation. So address the process. Choose messages that are personally acceptable. You have to frame it in a way that people can grasp. And one of the challenges with climate change is how do you make it personally salient? I cannot see, see carbon dioxide. I cannot feel increases in global mean temperature. I can see storms, but I cannot personally experience climate change. How do we put it in a domain or frame that people can understand? So for example, we can put it in the frame of economic competitiveness. If we don't develop the technologies in solar or wind, Germany or China will. I don't like that outcome. We better do something. 
I can put it in the frame of national security and the CNA group, a group of retired army generals are called climate change a threat multiplier. It will destabilize regions. It will force the US military to start to become active in areas in ways they weren't before, an outcome we don't want. One frame that works quite well is the health frame. If you have climate change, you will have the vulnerable in our population, those are called your grandparents and your children, become hurt by elevated temperatures in urban centers, as has happened in Chicago and Paris. Now you personalize it in a way that people can grasp, and they can start to say, okay, this is something we need to do something about it. You can put it in the frame of risk management, in a frame that we all understand. Maybe you don't own a house yet, but I, for example, have House, I have fire insurance on my house. The odds of it burning down are low. The consequences of it, will, it will ruin me. I can't afford not to do it. So someone can say the possibility of climate change actually happening is low, and you can say, but the consequence is high. And in that kind of a situation, we take out insurance. And on this, what's insurance? It's investment in behavior and technology change. And people can start to understand. Recognize the power of language. Uh, there are interesting studies to show that whether you use climate change or global warming, it actually cues your audience, leads them in a different direction. Uh, with Democrats and liberals, it doesn't matter. With conservatives and Republicans who are disinclined to believe climate change is real, global warming gets them more infuriated than climate change. That allows, for example, James Inhofe to throw a snowball on the floor of the US Senate in April and say, how can global warming be happening when it's this cold outside? So your language matters. Um, I wanna save time for questions, so they're in the book. Uh, and then present solutions for a commonly desired future. Uh, one of the criticisms of the environmental movement is they focus on the negative. Uh, um, Schellenberger and Nordhaus wrote a very well publicized essay called The Death of Environmentalism, and they pointed out that environmentalists focus on the negative. That doesn't motivate people to act, the positive does. And they make their point in a very funny way that will catch. He said that one of the most inspirational speeches of all time was by Martin Luther King. It was called I Have a Dream, not called I Have a Nightmare. You want to focus on the positive to get people to move forward. Why should we move towards a climate change world? How do we adapt to this in a way that's attractive? Balancing individual and community responsibility, there's a lot of work on this, the difference in, in between liberals and conservatives. Liberals more about the community, conservatives more about the individual. Liberals more around egalitarianism, conservatives more around hierarchy, there's a lot of work. How do we frame climate change in a way that will resonate with individual responsibility and respect for hierarchy? It's an interesting challenge and a way to think about it. Frame it as preserving the American way of life. That's something you appeal to superordinate goals. Um, I won't get into the other two, but these are the tactics that I'm offering for bridging the cultural schism. And so it's good, there's good actions in the book for moving forward. Uh, very quickly, the full scope of this issue. Um, I think it's important to place climate change within a broader context, an even broader context. How many people have heard of the, the, the term the Anthropocene? Good, you're an educated audience. For those who have not, climate change is actually just one of nine planetary boundaries within the Anthropocene. This can help us see the cultural challenge that's before us. The Anthropocene is put forward by geophysicists to say we've left the Holocene, we're now in the Anthropocene. You can't describe the environment without including us. We are now part of the animating force of what makes ecosystems work. And that is a fundamentally different game than all conceptions of environmental protection that precede us. And this creates a new urgency of us stepping into domains that we've never stepped into before. That is the essence or the crux of the cultural challenge before us, is to recognize that the world has now changed and our place within it has now changed. And that requires a change in conceptions of who we are and how we interact with the environment out there. In my opinion, the Pope's encyclical would, uh, um, on climate change is a statement of that saying, you know what, we're in a different place right now. Our interpretation of Genesis was wrong. We have to think about all the different aspects of our society and how it relates to each other and to the environment out there. We knew, uh, need a new spirituality. And in my opinion, if we don't start to hear more about climate change from the church, the mosque, the synagogue, the temple, we're gonna have a difficult, difficult time getting there because that's, for many of us, where our values reside. And if we can connect it to those deeply held values, we can really get traction here in ways that a carbon price may not be able to get us to. So I like to put climate change within that context. Okay, let me wrap up with my final vignette to tell you what I just told you. And I left that meeting with that climate skeptic potential donor. He actually never gave us any money. Um, 
And I wrote my first paper in this domain just to get myself started. That's the way academics do things. They start a stream, a thread. And so I wanted to lay the groundwork for thinking about climate change as a cultural issue. And I had two kind of throwaway paragraphs. The editors really liked them, trying to make analogies. And the first was cigarettes and human health. And I've already told you about that, that it took us a while to come to a consensus. And it was a culture shift to accept that, sci that, cli that cigarettes cause cancer and that the government should actually intervene to actually cripple a particular industry. That was very provocative. The Cato Institute went apoplectic over this, that the government should not be doing this. It was a big culture shift. How big is the culture shift on climate change? Well, I made a second analogy and said it's as big as the abolition of slavery. And the analogy is this. First of all, you cannot compare the horrors of one race against another, slavery with climate change, but in England, they had a peaceful abolition of slavery with people standing on the street corners saying we have to abolish this institution. And people said, you're out of your mind, you're gonna ruin our quality of life, the entire economy is based on it. Today, people are standing on the street corners of London saying we have to abolish fossil fuels. And people are saying, you're out of your mind, you're gonna ruin our quality of life, the entire economy is based on it. And over time, a debate ensued, and over time, we had a resolution. That paper came out, in a journal called Organizational Dynamics. I'm willing to bet none of you have ever read it, much less heard of it. It's an academic journal. And then the New York Times picked it up, and then Scientific American picked it up, and Time Magazine, and I was feeling pretty heady. I'm a public intellectual, isn't this great? People are reading my work, and I was really excited. And then a colleague sent me an email and said, I see Mark Morano is taking his hits at you. So I naively wrote back and said, who is Mark Morano? And he said, well, um, he used to work for Rush Limbaugh, he used to work for James Enhoff. He now has a web page called climatedepot.com. I really recommend you go look at it. And when I went to look at it, this is what I found. And so you can see my picture in the bottom right and Adolf Hitler's picture in the bottom left. And the entire coverage of, uh, of the article is what you see in those bold letters. Climate change skeptics are the moral equivalent of those who defended slavery. And there's my email address. And that's when things start to get interesting. So the emails start coming in. And this is just a small sample. Uh, they're pretty insulting, and one is actually, the one on the bottom made me a little nervous. It's a little uh, threatening. And I was confused by this. I mean, I'm an academic. Why are people sending emails? I've never met these people. I don't know who these people are. Why are they sending notes like this? And I'm, what do I do with these? And I thought, well, I'm a social scientist, so I should start to code them. So what, that's what I did. And what you can start to see is elements of the worldview that I just talked to you about. First of all, Skepticism of science and scientific elites. You know, are you an idiot? CO2 is plant food. It's not pollution. How can it be a problem? CO2 is being absorbed by plants. I'm a criminal. My days of milking, this phony, my, milking the system with my phony science are numbered. You self-appointed overseers expect us peasants will take you and your fellow scientists seriously. I don't trust scientists. You're a bunch of elites sitting in this ivory tower using a language I don't understand, talking about an issue I don't comprehend, and having a disproportionate influence on the political process. I don't trust you. Second, suspicion of my political ideology. I'm doing the work of Satan, up on the top there. Uh, I'm a green terrorist, I want to slay people. I must be a secular evolutionist. If I believe in climate change, I must not believe in God, I must believe in evolution. The worldview starts to come into, into, into form. Eco-imperialism, I'm a racist. Uh, fear of economic disaster. Why do I want to lower the standard of living of Americans? Why do I want to de-develop the world? Greetings, comrade. Why do you want Marxist destruction of civilization? I must be a communist if I'm believing in this. What would compel people to send emails like this to someone they don't know over an issue of science? The answer is, for them, it is not an issue of science. For them, there are certain values that they hold dear that they feel are threatened by the notion of climate change. That's the level of the conversation. That's what we need to focus on. That's where we need to bring the conversation if we're going to reach any kind of a social consensus that this is real. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Can you please use the mic and clear oh. Social media actually exaggerates the doubt over climate change. Sure. So, for example, sometimes I will say my see my friends posting something like, "Oh, it's so cold! It's such a cold winter." Hashtag 
where the hell is uh, global warming. But when it's actually hot, they might not post it because it's more fun to, to have something that contrasts, contrasts like the popular idea of climate change. Yeah. And that may, I don't know if you've noticed anything like that, that yeah. may explain the social consciousness declining. Yeah, well, social media, we're creating these bubbles around ourselves. There was a really nice study at the University of Indiana. They got um, their hands on about a half million tweets before the midterm elections. And they ran an algorithm, coded them liberal or conservative, and then they looked at who's retweeting them. And they drew a network map, and it was very clear there's a very red cluster and a very blue cluster, some interconnections, but totally different conversations. Who you choose to be your Facebook friends or your Twitter followers generally are people that have a similar worldview to you. And so they reinforce, reinforce your worldview and help solidify it. I heard a really great quote by a, a guy who studies marketing and, and, and social media. He said, social media doesn't make us more informed, it just makes us more certain. And I think that's really what social media does to us. We're gonna have to figure out what to do about this because it is creating, uh, our, we're allowed to create our own communities with our own facts. And, and that becomes problematic for a functioning democracy. So I think social media plays a tremendous role in forming our particular views on issues. So uh, first off, thank you. Uh, and I, I see a lot of connection between the sort of the cigarettes and the, and the abolition uh, movement. If that is true, it, it would provide me a sense of optimism that, yeah. that in the end, uh, I think Martin Luther King said something like the, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Um, do, you, do you take some optimism from the similarities you see with those movements in terms of the direction that, that this will go? in the 100-year the trajectory. Yeah, um, I, I have two pieces to my answer. One is that um, optimism and hope are two different things. And I bring that up importantly because optimism looks at the odds and says they're in my favor, I'm going for it. Hope says I don't care what the odds are, I'm gonna do something. I'm hopeful but pessimistic. I think the odds are against it, honestly. But I'm hopeful that we'll figure it out. And the reason I say that is because one rub here is that we're talking about natural systems moving on a certain trajectory and social systems not keeping up. And so people get worried. But social systems can happen, they can change very, very quickly in response in particular to a critical event. Think about 9-11. Literally, literally overnight our conceptions of freedom and privacy changed. And our awareness of the world around us changed. A lot of uh, people point to the analogy of gay marriage and how quickly that shifted in terms of our uh, psyche and our norms and values within society. So I am hopeful that an event will stimulate change. The key is that activists, the, the events are not objective realities. Let me say that in a less, acad less academic way. An event happens and you frame it. Key powerful people frame it as a problem that leads to a certain conclusion. If it was a different presidency than George W. Bush, the outcome of 9-11 would have been different. I'm not making a, sta a pejorative statement here, it's just a reality. How he framed it might have been different than how Al Gore might have framed it. How they frame it leads to a certain outcome. We sometimes miss opportunities. I think the Gulf oil spill, the environmental movement was nowhere to be found. That was framed entirely as a jobs and economic issue and therefore no serious reflection on the lengths we're going to to extract fossil fuels to feed the economy that we enjoy. But I do think that certain events, like for example, uh, Hurricane Sandy. Michael Bloomberg was a powerful spokesman. Anyone who saw Business Week after Hurricane Sandy, it was all black with big left letters, big red letters said that was climate change stupid. And it showed a picture of Manhattan all dark. And he came out and said this is climate change. Uh, that is important, the social elements of that, but you need spokespeople to frame issues. This is social science going all the way back to uh, the structure of scientific revolutions or put it in the more vernacular, uh, Rahm Emanuel, uh, paraphrasing social science, said never waste a good crisis. In a crisis, you can get people to change. And so you have to take advantage of those crises. You make them into, frame them into something that will demand an answer. I do believe that we can shift quickly. Yes? Yeah, thank you. of war, right. and then in 2009, Barack Obama said, I want to make caulking sexy. 
Wait, make what? Caulking, wind, oh, know, okay. energy okay. efficiency. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there anything the uh, next president of the United States could say to move the dial? Uh, you know, there are multiple frames. I think that Jimmy Carter saying it's a moral equivalent of war, I mean, a lot of people just laughed at that. It just, it wasn't a frame that resonated. Um, it's a good question. What frame would I use if I were president? Um, you know, you have to find frames that that people accept. You know, every exec, we're in a business school. And you as executives, when you leave here, will have personal motivations for doing things, and you'll have your justification. They're two very different things. I think we should do this because I agree with the Pope's encyclical letter. In that letter, it said, this is an issue of religion, morality. It's, it's not an issue of whether, give me the business case. That actually becomes absurd in his framing. It's just we have to do it. Um, but I don't know if I can compel people with that message. So I have to find a frame that people can rally around. And whether it's you know uh, the lifestyle you want to live, you want to keep living it or get better, you want your children to have a better world. Children is a very powerful frame. Connect it with their future generations. Um, uh, you know, it's just, and it would have to be multiple messages for multiple audiences. So if I'm talking to this group, and I do this in my own work. I mean, I'm in two schools. Anyone who's in the CBay program can resonate with this. I go over to the school environment. I'm a capitalist sellout. I go over to the business school. I'm a tree hugger. <laughs> but if I dress the part and use the language, I can speak to each audience. Sitting in that middle is a very powerful position because I can understand the language and I can translate across boundaries. And that's the key. It's what, what audience am I speaking to? What will resonate for them? How do I get them on board? And, and then different messages for different audiences. Long with an answer, but it's a good question. Yes? So yeah, thanks so much for speaking. My question is your thoughts on the environmental activist movement. As someone who sits in the middle of two schools, the business school and the environmental school here, I sometimes struggle when I see some of my friends who were also environmental studies undergrad get really excited over Greenpeace pushing really hard an environmental agenda, um, which I, you know, it can feel kind of counteractive. I'm curious what your thoughts on that very radical environmental agenda are within the environmental community as well as this debate as a whole? That's a very good question, and, and I do bring it up in the book. Uh, I want to introduce to you a concept called the radical flank effect. And this is developed by a gentleman named Haynes around the civil rights movement in the 60s. And let me explain it this way, the way he tried to explain it. You had a message from Martin Luther King, and white America was choking on it. It was too radical until Malcolm X came along and pulled the radical flank way out here, and all of a sudden, Martin Luther King becomes a moderate. The same is true in the environmental movement. The radical message from the Green Pieces and uh, Earth First and all these groups is important for pulling the debate out here, allowing what used to be the flank to now be the middle. For example, I think two important messages right now are Naomi Klein and Bill McKibben. I think both of them are unrealistic in their goals. I think Naomi Klein in particular is completely unrealistic. I don't think we're going to shred capitalism and develop something new. I think it's socially impossible and politically implausible. But she is raising questions about what elements of capitalism are causing this problem. We have to go to the root of the issue. And so she's opening up a new flank in the conversation. I think Bill McKibben as well. He wants to make the fossil fuel industry die. It's not going to happen in a short order. If you just look at the number of the amount of assets and what it would do to the economy, uh, it's actually quite striking. If you look at the the asset values of these companies, the fossil fuel companies, they're, 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 it, it's quite horrific for Wall Street. Um, but he's entering the conversation, and he's been able to create a social movement, young people, and he's be able to create an enemy, whether it's Keystone or the oil companies, and so they pull the flank out. So I think they have a very important place. Without them, the moderate position would be the flank, and therefore they would be, the answer would be further in. You follow where I'm going there? Yeah. Yes. Hi. Okay. Yeah, hi. I'm Michelle. I'm studying at the forestry school, okay. uh, business and environment. My question is, um, I'm coming from Europe, so climate change is already much more accepted debate there, mm -hmm. or just a fact. 
Um, have you as well looked at Europe or China and looked at some learnings from there or mm -hmm. similar that you can like bring to the US? Because yeah. I, it seemed to be very US focused. Yeah, I think these are very interesting questions. Um, the Republican, the GOP in the United States is an outlier in terms of political ideologies that reject the science of climate change. Uh, there are interesting cultural dimensions that make Europe particularly different than the United States. Uh, one thing that makes the climate skeptic movement so visible in the United States is it maps so neatly on the political landscape, that the values around climate rejection, I don't want to destroy the economy, I don't trust government. In Europe, there are climate skeptics, but it doesn't, it doesn't map into the political landscape. They're diffused, so they're not as visible. Also, in this country, I don't know if you know this, but it's written into the American Constitution that we will be guaranteed the right to cheap gasoline. I don't know if you know that. A lot of people don't know that. It's a third rail. A gas tax is a third rail. Look at the price of gasoline in Europe. People aren't uncomfortable with the idea of heavy taxes on gasoline. Um, if you're going to have a carbon tax, you're going to raise the price of energy. That is anathema in this country where people accept that in other parts of the world. I can go through other dimensions of it well, but it comes down to cultural values. And I do find them fascinating. Why, is, why are GMOs? so quietly accepted here and so violently rejected in Europe. Why is abortion, non-issue in Europe, a violent issue here? It comes down to the cultural values that are triggered by these issues. Climate change can be looked at in the same way. Okay? Andy, okay. thanks so much. Please